I want to have sort of an aside. I want to shout out to, uh, I can't believe I said that. I, I want to <laughs> have a salute to one of my favorite um, Instagram people, which is London Mudlark. And she is a very nice lady, and she spends her days doing her wonderful hobby, which I greatly envy her the ability to do, which is that she mudlarks. She goes up and down the Thames River on the side, and she looks for erosion because, of course, London has thousands of years of history built around that river. And she finds all kinds of amazing things. It's so cool. Uh, and I desperately, desperately wish I had, like, three things that she would find. I don't care what it is, but... I, I would love to have a few little things and I'd frame them and put them back up there. A little clay pipe or a piece of tile or, I don't know, some embroidery, a button. A button? Uh, she, no, she posted a live video this morning and she found, um, she found a beautiful, uh, like, 16th century, like from the 1500s button that still had its, its fish eye hook on the back. Hmm. And she finds all kinds of stuff and she just slogs around with her rubber wellington boots on and finds neat stuff okay i love finding neat stuff we never find neat stuff there's no neat stuff here to find well there are fossils if you go to the right place right there are fossils we found fossils i mean this i mean there were plains indians here but i've never I, in my entire life i've never found anything i've never found a arrowhead nothing i've never found anything related to frontier days or the wild west or any well, have you gone looking well, no, I wouldn't find anything. Okay, sorry, just a little segment. Anyway, London Mudlark, if you are watching this, is there any way I can talk you out of like three neat little things that have no intrinsic value, that just have history and show some of the human touch? That would be fantastic. If not, I certainly understand. Okay. Well, for, hang on. We're too far away. I dropped my Carmex top. As you'll notice. Cut, cut my hair. Cut my Almost cut my hair today. Do you remember that song? Of course I do. Ridiculous. So, 14 years ago today, this young lady and myself stood in front of a fairly confused Justice of the Peace <laughs> in... Was, that was in, was it in, no, oh, it was in Norwood. It was mm -hmm. in, in Norwood, Massachusetts, and we, we tied the knot. And then we went with my family, who had, my extended family, who had shown up um, basically without invitation, which, yes. which is what they do. Yes. Um, and, and we went to a Thai restaurant, uh, which all we wanted to do was just get married and just... Be done with it. <laughs> be done with it, move on. Like, you know, we still haven't had a honeymoon. I don't care. <laughs> What? So, 14 years ago was the culmination of us talking for a long time on a, a Star Trek message board. So, that was our first mutual interest together. So, we should commemorate it by bitching about Star Trek. What are we going to complain about? Picard? Michael Burnham? Michael Burnham. And by Picard, we mean the Picard show. The Picard show. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, he just, you know, it had some interesting bits, but it didn't seem, it didn't seem like, he, it seemed like he was playing himself. It would seem like he was playing Patrick Stewart. Yeah, not Picard. Yeah, he was playing Patrick Stewart, who sometimes was playing Picard. Yes. And Michael Burnham. Man, how many times can they shoehorn her into everything? Apparently, the season finale of Series 2 is who, her, like, Superman flying through the universe in her special secret time suit. Spoiler alert, but we never saw it. <laughs> we didn't last that long. The only episode that was truly blew me away was the was the standalone single piece one set in a thousand years in the future where the guy finds the... Without Michael Burnham. Without Michael Burnham. Where they finds the guy is just gets pulled in by this empty ship that's been drifting in a nebula for a thousand years. That was a cool episode. That was awesome. But instead, everything has to be raising the stakes, end of the world, oh my god, everything's going to explode... Only Michael Burnham can save us. <laughs> Are you satisfied now that you got that out of your system? I just, I, it's just like, why do they have to involve Spock? Why do they have to, I mean, okay, fine. I'm going to be interested to see 
We're going to watch it. No, well, no. I'm going to be interested to see how the Pike show rolls out. I think that could be cool if they do it right, but it's the same writers that do Discovery. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> you do, once you get them started, there's no nothing. Oh, and Simon Pegg was talking about the next Star Trek movie, Star Trek IV, but he says that he has no idea if it's going to happen or if it's going to be the Kelvin crew or anything. He doesn't know anything. I don't think it's going to happen. I think those the dream is over. Yep. That's too bad. Anyway, 14 years of marriage. Just like this. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, let's do... You're welcome. What? You're welcome. Oh, no, you're welcome. <laughs> um, uh, let's do a uh, wrist check. Or a wrist check. I'm boring. There it is. I had to go back into it yesterday to do a thing. With the stuff. With the stuff. But I went back into it and everything's fine. And I am wearing this 6309-7049 from December 1979. This was the recent triumph I had with my Revitalume. Uh, this is one of those watches where it had gotten not water inside, but it, it had been gotten humidity inside and subjected to heat and the hand loom turned gray and the dial loom turned sort of a yellowish blackish gray it had been in my parts drawers for a really long time and it occurred to me i was like well i wonder if my revital loom will work on this and it worked on both it worked on both so I was like, well, I've come this far, and I set aside some time, and I rebuilt the movement completely. I also installed a 6306 hacking lever, so it hacks, so it's fully restored. Now, I, I have one of these, and I don't keep duplicates, so I'm going to be selling this watch, this 1979 Seiko 6309. So if somebody's looking for one that's all original loom that went through my Revital loom, and uh, it's going to be available. And it's got that rare and expensive and important upgrade with the 6306 hacking lever. Fully rebuilt, all that stuff. Completely original. Except for, the, of course, the cleaned up loom, but it's original loom. Anyway, so there it is. It is a, I mean, I'm tempted to keep it because it's proof of concept of my Ventilum. It's, uh, not Ventilum, my Revitalum. It's the first flat dial I've ever brought back and it's the first handset 6309 handset that I brought back that turned out this well um but the other ones I tried were a lot more damaged in a different way so anyway there it is you need one there it is okay should I get started I don't know if you feel like it okay from Julie Hill hi Julie Lockdown with cat farts. Ain't life swell. <laughs> Spencer, regarding the rusty NG floor panels, I'm always reminded of the Flintstone and Fred's footmobile. No need for a foot, a floor panels or brakes. Simply use your feet and go and stop. I dread to think what I would find if I got my camper van stripped back and sandblasted. A hole developed near the accelerator pedal recently and required some welding. Old vehicles, huh? More life support than anything else. Uh, my, um... My car, not the not the VW that I learned to drive in, that was the gray one, uh, but the one that I drove all through high school is my car, uh, was a green 63. And it died because I took a left at a stop sign during a late spring snowstorm. And there was a driver coming the other way, and she, I guess she feared that she, she was trying to stop at the stop sign, but then it was real slushy, and she I think she decided that she, she just couldn't make it, couldn't stop in time, and so she went for it but i was in the intersection she smashed right in the side of my 63 and thankfully there was no one in the passenger side uh because it smashed that door right up to the side of me here but about the rust there were, i didn't think that car was that rusty but the entire underneath of the car basically where the vertical met the horizontal was unattached it was just it just gone why would you drive in that what do you mean it was my car we used to drive dad used to he was so cheap that he would drive cars with tires that he got at the junkyard. I remember once we were driving a car with tires that were so bald. It was summer. I remember this. We were going out to his testing, testing ponds out there. And all of a sudden we're driving along, windows are out and I hear, <laughs> it's because one of the tires had literally worn through. Like not like blown or popped or anything. It had worn through to the point that it wore a little hole through the main part of the tire wow. right into the inside. 
I knew how to, I knew how to change a tire in a Volkswagen before I knew how to drive. I can't believe and for somebody who constantly talked about safety and and he would let us drive like that. Oh. Crazy. Uh, oh, hang on a second. So after Julie, then comes Mr. James Duffy of the Sandwich Time Channel. Mr. James Duffy of the Sandwich Time Channel. Hi, SNS. It's been a, a minute since Mr. Duff, James Duffy of the Sandwich Time Channel asked a question. I know you love my Seiko tuna, so that's funny. What? A tuna? That's what they're called. No, I know, but he did the sandwiches. Oh. <laughs> How would you make a sandwich that would be the Seiko tuna? How would you call it that? Uh, anyway, I know you love my Seiko tuna, so I need to know, how can I tighten the bezel on it? The bezel action on mine feels sloppy with a lot of back play. Is it just the standard Seiko click spring? Is it, it is an expensive watch, so I'm afraid to pop off the bezel unless I know what I'm doing. Uh, the first thing we want to look for, because um, as with all of those Seiko rotating rings, they're they're held in place by a snap fit, so it's it's going to be... Uh, there's going to be a ridge, if the watch is here, okay, there's the dial of the watch. There's going to be a ridge on the case like this, and then there's going to be a ridge underneath that rotating ring, and it goes click like this, all the way around. It's a, it's a tight fit. What gives it, what takes away the slop and makes it feel nice and tight is that O-ring gasket. Uh, so if the O-ring gaskets, as they, as they get old and they turn hard, um, you, they can get kind of rattly. Um, I'd have to see what's up with yours. Personally, you can't really hurt it pulling the, the rotating ring off. You, you can't. Um, you can get a case knife for not a lot of money. You can get a crystal press for not a lot of money. Um, they're basic and they'll do the job. And so you have a case knife and a crystal gasket, maybe a thing of silicone, silicone grease. You can get them on eBay for, I think they're like eight bucks for a little tub of silicone grease. And um, then you could check it out and see what's under there and then you can clean it off it's a, an essential piece of cleaning your watch doing that so if you want any guidance let me know and if you can think of how you'd make a sandwich called the seiko tuna let me know <laughs> from rob was i wrong i thought i heard a bit of bob marley come out of your mouth you need to grow your hair really long and get some dreads sorry sorry I, i'm back to regulation so you know leave is over back i think we did a good job no i think we did do a good job no, I think we did a great job. I mean, considering that yeah. I did some of the sides myself. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. why I said we. Yep. The horologist. Came. Oh, Bob Marley. She likes Bob Marley. What? <laughs> what was that look for? Because. The horologist? Yes. What's up with that name? It's a pun or a play on words. Yeah. Somebody who studies um, professional <laughs> ladies. <laughs> and times them. And times them. That's what chronographs are for. Actually, why would you be timing her? She would be timing you. I'm gonna die. <laughs> okay. Camera holder fail. It still didn't swear on camera. Bless it. Nice one, Ned. Uh, I, I, actually, that's kind of where I got that from. Simpsons. Um, there's a particular time when um, I don't know, Hubbard does something stupid to Ned Flanders, uh, ex and he's exasperated, annoyed, and he says, "Ah." God bless him. And I, I don't know. I was like, you know, I'm trying to be a nicer person. Try to be. Oh, I'm not going to say the quote. What? The, the, Car the Carmen, Carmel Soprano. Oh, okay. No, you're I'm not. I'm not going to say that quote. No, you're not. All right. Because it's not true. Well, well I'm still trying. Yes. Doesn't mean I'm going to succeed. <laughs> anyway, go on. Wrong crowd. I have a 6002 with the same issue with the dry seals, I suspect. Thanks for showing how they deteriorate and can be replaced. Mm -hmm. Spencer, you mentioned the watch appears to have low miles. What's the best way to keep it that way without having any issues with springs, etc., further down the road? It's like anything. Um, if you uh, these watches, a lot of these old '70s watches, these old guys, they they would just wear their watches and they just beat them to death. Uh, they'd wear them and wear them and wear them and they'd never take them off. And then when the time came. They'd just chuck them in a drawer, and they'd wear them until they died, and then they'd buy a new one. Um, keep your watch clean externally. Uh, take it off if you're up on the if you're up doing roofing. Um, try not to get it completely filthy. Uh, just I don't know. Avoid doorknobs, that kind of thing. You just you just you just treat it gently. 
try to not be like me. Run into doorknobs. Yeah, yesterday I cleaned off yet another stripe on that crystal, but it's okay. It cleans off nicely. I can't walk straight. It doesn't matter. Todd S. It's clear that your first love are these gold dials, but how did you find a divot on the cat jewel? Uh, this is a question that Todd put on about a 6139, um, 6005. Not a pogue, not a true pogue. It's later. It's no text. Uh, the reason I, I, I get so so woogie about those gold dials like that is because it's so rare to see them when they're so nice. Because those gold dials, they tend to, they have all kinds of different ways that they can sort of age and degrade. Um, and so when I see one that, that is that nice, and it was clear that it was kept away from oxygen, that it lived in the, it slept in the dark of somebody's sock drawer for a very long time, it's just, it's a time machine. And so you get to see something that's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, what was the second part of his thing? Oh, the divot on the cap tool. I have a couple levels of magnification, and I was looking at the cap tool, and when I'm looking at the cap tool with full magnification, it's probably about this big. So imagine like almost slightly smaller than teacup size, but I was looking at it, and you could actually see a little circle, like a teeny tiny little circle, like a flake was gone right in the middle where the where the thing would sit, and, and that's what it was. It somehow ground through or there was a manufacturing error or something, or there was a shock. Ooh, I bet that's what it was. It was a shock. And um, it was just enough to take off a teeny shatter off a microscopic flake of it there. But you could see it. And so I was like, okay, it's not a smooth surface. You can see the divot. So I replaced it. I got to the next one. What are they doing? I don't know. What do you think they're doing? Hammering. I don't know. She's making she's making a uh, vending machine, a claw game uh, vending machine. Oh yeah, in the goldfish thing. Mm -hmm. From Spencer Braithwaite, boy, if you build any other part specials and decide you don't want them, just send them to me. About celebrity watches, ugh, why does everybody seem to care so much? I understand racing drivers, astronauts, pilots, etc., but I don't really understand the obsession with celebrities in general. I don't know, indeed. Well, like the Brad Pitt watch, I just, I don't I've always liked Brad Pitt, and I thought that was a cool movie. Sure. Um, I, I mean, this 6309, a lot of celebrities wore these. There's a famous, pic relatively famous picture of Mick Jagger in the 80s wearing one of these. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, and then a number, they were in a number of different movies. It's just a way to sort of maybe give some personality, some connection also. I mean, the Brad Pitt watch, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Or the Arnie. Or the Arnie, absolutely. The Arnie, I mean, I mean, other than that, it's just a weird dated sport diver from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Stop licking me. I mean, because like without the Arnie connection, look at the H601, the, the, the successor to the H558. Instead of having the... LCD at the top, it has it on the bottom. But more or less, it looks almost exactly the same. No one cares about the H601. It's not worth a terrible amount of money. People have tried to drum up interest in them, but, you know, they're not an Arnie, so they're not an Arnie. From Rob, 20 years ago, I left a little cabin at a small rural dump in northern Ontario in the winter because my friend who worked there said there was a wolf outside. He was worried it would attack us, and I had to assure him we would be fine, walked out the door, and just stood and looked at the timber wolf sitting five feet in front of us. Aren't they really big? I don't know. I've never seen one. We looked at each other for five minutes, and then he trotted 150 feet up the hill to the trees, turned around and looked back at us as I waved bye-bye, and then he disappeared into the forest. The wolf is my favorite wild animal. That was before cameras and cell phones. It's in my head, though. I have been close to bears, moose, and coyotes as well. The only thing I would not like to be close to is a cougar. Uh, they kill people out here in Vancouver Island from time to time, jumping out of trees onto a person. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go anywhere near a cougar. There's a pretty famous video, the one that that lady took of her back deck. Mm -hmm. And there's a family of cougars. It's the mother and like three nearly grown, what do you call a young but not adult cat? I don't know. What, they're nearly fully grown. Basically, there were four cougars on this lady's back deck. And that was in Colorado. That was down in Boulder. Um, I tell you, murder kittens. Murder <laughs> kittens. So, I mean, we've seen a moose. Yeah, we saw a moose. Um, it was right in front of us, right in front of the car. And we just parked and waited for it to move. We were like, that's really big. Yeah. Gosh, that's a big animal. Uh, I saw a fox. We've seen foxes. <laughs> I, I, I've heard coyotes. I, I saw was... one trot down the road once. 
I've heard, I remember being, we were camping when I was a kid, and we were way the hell up in the San Juans, and uh, way, 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 like two days hike from anything, and uh, I, you could hear them at night, yipping, but uh, I'm trying to think of any other wildlife I've seen. I've never seen a rattlesnake, thank goodness. Ugh. Um I hate snakes. Lots of hawks, see hawks and eagles. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a porcupine once. So did I. On the western slope I saw. Um, it was big, a lot bigger than I expected. I saw an armadillo. I've never seen an armadillo to I my have. certain knowledge. I have, when I was in Florida. I've seen marmots, and pica. You've seen marmots. Yes. That big, <laughs> big fat, trundly thing. Mm -hmm. And prairie dogs. And prairie dogs, They're yes. They're everywhere here. Yeah, I, I remember seeing a lot of pica when we were hiking when I was a kid, and they're, they're sadly, they're having a lot of problems with um, climate change because they can only go so high. You can only go so high up before you run on a mountain. Pikas are very cute. They're teeny tiny. They look like gerbils, but they live in rock fields, scree fields, and they make this beep noise, and you can hear them. Do they look? Do they have tails? Or uh, they... I think they're tailless, and they're quite small. Because I remember one time when we were up at Rocky Mountain National Park, we saw when Sadie was little, we saw something that looked kind of like a chipmunk, but it might have been a chipmunk. I think it was a chipmunk. Oh. I haven't seen a pika for years. Okay, okay. Let's... sorry about that. Sorry about that. We're we're blathering this morning. Yeah. The wristwatch experience. I have a soft spot for Landeron movements. They sold in the millions and can be looked down at by a certain watch collector type, a snob. But um, they are real workhorses. I was lucky to pick up a Landeron 47 from 1937. See, it always rings about two minutes early. This was the first cam movement with the flyback, but the coolest feature is they have three pushers. Oh yeah, actually, I've, uh, oh shoot, I put it away. I have one of those, I have a Landron 47. I got it years ago. And it's the one where actually the reset is in the crown. It's stop, start, wait, start, stop, reset. It, it, it's really cool. And boy, trying to find one of those crowns with the pushers to the middle, impossible. I need to reservice it again, I serviced it eight years ago, and I probably did not do a very good job. Well, why don't you look at it again? I did. It's, I saw it yesterday. No, I mean, open it up and look at it and Maybe. critique yourself. Maybe I should. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool piece. All right. Well, I, I can insert the thing. Okay. Lander on. i got to clean my thingy. Lander on. Yeah, so here are some, these are some Landeron watches. These were very typical for their time. Uh, one could apparently go to Switzerland and you could visit there and you could buy a genuine Swiss chronograph, chronograph Suisse. And they had all these different chronographs. They had a million billion of the things and you could get them. And um, Like there's one I just learned that was like in a solid gold case, but the case itself is hollow and actually quite thin and you can actually like bend and crumple the lugs, but it's solid gold. But so there are a ton of these around, a lot of these, but the Landron movement is one that not a lot of people think about. The Landron movement that I became aware of was in this. This was a Landron 47, which was a, actually made in 1930. 37 and again one of these sort of not no name but just sort of um hang on basically you could get these landron movements with all kinds of different branding on them this is the first one that i ever came aware of my brother loves this watch because he loves the font the number font anyway but i got this a long time ago and i cleaned up the dial and did the stuff, but it's it's really very interesting because it has the way this works. This first generation lander on. Uh, let's see if I can get it even running. Come on, come on, run. Wait. Well, it's clearly running. Well, it used to run. I don't know what's happening here. Should be start, start, stop, reset. Hm. I don't know why it's not running. I think I really have to put aside some time and service this baby. Well, let's open it up. I haven't looked inside this thing for a very long time.
Got to be so careful opening these so the blade doesn't slip. Oh, would you stop it? Anyway. Yeah, very straightforward. Not a whole lot different. I mean, 1937, and this is a land around 248, and they're very similar. They do, they do, they're, they're great watches. They have some, one of the things I like about these Landerons is they actually have some wonderful simplicity in terms of adjustments. These are the two hammers for the, for the big minute counter central hand. And I'm sorry, for the seconds hand. And then the minute counter hand is here. This is the hammer. It centers them both. If you want to make sure that that both hammers touch simultaneously, well, you see, it's got this big split here. This screw has a beveled bottom and as you tighten it down it'll expand it'll push those we those levers apart it's a really simple system very 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 simple very straightforward easy to use and these things they have a lot of commonality you can uh, the hands all fit across all the the things you can swap a lot of parts back and forth I don't know, it's it's pretty neat. Okay, so I, I have to look in this and figure out why it's not behaving. Okay, there's the reset. Looks like uh, that's binding up. That spring is weak. That's our issue. So there it is, it's pulling power. Gosh darn it! Pulling power from the train here, which it runs through this intermediate wheel, which is on this lever that goes back and forth. And this should drop that onto here, and that starts to turn the... So then we start it, we stop it, and we reset it. Just like that. I'll take some time this weekend, maybe, and, and redo this watch. How of a job did you do? Could you tell? No, it runs. It runs. I mean, it's clean enough. I mean, it looks kind of hazy, but I mean, this watch had water in it. I don't know. I'll have to look at it. Um, it does look bad. I'll go through it. I'll I'll re I'll resurface it, and we'll see. Anyway, but they're cool. The nice thing about these Landerons is they are really affordable. They are really really affordable. And if you read about the movements, like especially like the. Uh, the Lander on 187 tends to be a bigger chronograph, like 40 millimeters, and it has a date. And they're pretty cool. Lander on 248, man, I got great numbers out of mine. Um, they're a wonderful. There's a lot of variety. There's a ton of these kind of watches around. Um, they're they're a good size from the smaller up to 40 millimeters, depending. You can get them for not a lot of money. In terms of a chronograph, in terms of servicing, they're painless. I mean. And I, I say that, and people are going to be like, oh, yeah, sure. Servicing a chronograph is going to be painless. But seriously, in this case, relatively speaking, boy, these are easy to do. Anyway, all fun. So, yeah, it's cool. My brother loves the font on that dial. You'll have to show it to me. It's neat. Okay, A.V. Cuber. Hi, Spencer and Sabrina. Why can't I find anything on the 31 6000 Seiko's first electric watch? Apparently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay, yes, you clarified this. Uh, the the 31-6000, you called it the horseshoe. Uh, I'll, I'll insert a picture of it here. Okay, we dug up a picture of that. So that's why you call it the horseshoe, because it's got that horseshoe shape case. I, I've never heard of the watch. Like, the logo that's on that dial, I've never seen. Um, the logo is cool. The logo is cool. Um but I've, I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it. I've never heard anyone discuss it. Um, it seems like one of those watches that you just, it just vanished. It was, you know, a, a test run or maybe something, but they didn't make a lot of them. I don't know. It's, it's a wacky watch. I'd love to see one, but they go for a lot of money. And so I doubt I'm ever going to own one. I've never even heard. You're the only person I've had ask about them. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Finney took my little spot. No, it's... Oh, over there. Oh, gotcha. Right okay. Some coder. On your World War II Japanese sword, any idea of which family it belonged to, which plant smith it was made by? Do you do any Japanese collectors get in touch with American owners? Uh, that's a few questions. That sword is... Actually, we're sitting on top of it. Let's 
It's in there. It's not that one. No, it's not that one. There's no, I don't have an idea of what smith it was. It is, it was hand forged, uh, probably in the World War II era. It was not made by a factory. It has no factory stamps. Um, I kind of like those factory swords because they'll usually, they'll have signatures on them. They'll have a stamp from the factory. They often have painted marks on the inside in, in red and yellow I've seen before. Uh, I used to have one. They were cool. This one doesn't have anything like that. It's it's a handmade Nihonto blade uh, that um, has a nice clear hamon that unfortunately had a lot of rust down at the tip. Um, it's unsigned. It was not a factory piece. The family crest on it, uh, the mon, I used to remember what it is, but I would have to go look at it. I've never been contacted by anybody from Japan. Seriously, they have, the Japanese have figured out that non-Japanese will buy this stuff and they are dumping tons of this stuff. It's a, you know, it, it, one thing I've learned is that these Japanese swords are not rare. There are tons of them. There's a seller on eBay out of Japan and all he sells is like unfinished old swords or heavily damaged blades, original ones, and he sells them for 50 or 60 bucks. You can get one and practice how to polish. Um, and on eBay, I mean, some of these sellers, they have magnificent museum piece quality stuff. They're selling everything, everything they get their hands on, you know, so now's a good time to buy. But no, they've never, nobody's ever contacted me. Why would they? From Forbin Colossus, yes, we'd like to see a how-to video of a simple, simple Seiko movement swap NH36 into another case or an SKX build from parts. Sabrina is right. Yes. If you, it's simple if you've done it before. Yeah, okay. So I was looking at my parts yesterday. I actually pulled out my drawer of diver stuff. And um, I have a number of different things that I would consider... I have one watch. It's a 7,500-8062. It's a dress watch from the 60s. They're notable because they're large. They're 38 millimeters, but they also have the 62 MAS handsets. And I was looking at it, and I'm like, well, and I tested something that the, that a 7,005 dial will drop right onto a 6R, 4R movement because they're the same family. Literally, it'll go, it'll go right on. You don't have to deal with the feet or anything. Just it pops on. So I'm considering taking this 60s watch and rebuilding a 6R15 I have here that is loose, that is just never ran right. It has almost no miles on it. Rebuilding it and making it, this watch from the 60s, a hand winder with a 6R15. So maybe. If I had a bezel, I can't make an SKX because I don't have the right, that the bezel is the one thing I'm missing. I think. Do I have a bezel? I'll have to look. I might have one. I'd be shocked, though, if I did. But if I do, I could build a brand new SKX. Do I have the case back? I've got everything else. I've got the hands and the dial. I've got the movement. I have the crowns. I don't know that I have a case back. I know I have a case. I'm not sure I have a rotating ring. I'll have to dig, but I'll come up with the project. I've been watching the cats. Milo wanted a spot, and Finny was like, no, and was biting him, and then Milo was like, well, then I'm going to clean you. Is that a horse? Oh, no. Okay, well, let's push on. Okay. From Rick, there's tons of videos all over YouTube showing how to do a 7S26 to NH36 swap. Some things to consider if you're wanting to take this on. If it's for an SKX, you can buy an SARB059 crown and stem, which will fit the case, thus avoiding the stem resizing stuff. I think about putting a 6R15 in mine, but they don't come with weekday hardware, and some recent examples don't have the pin for the corrector wheel. It's just easier and a lot cheaper to get an NH36 with the weekday stuff already on it. Another thing is most loose NH36 movements come with a three minute, three o'clock. Oh, uh, yeah, crowned at three instead oh, of 345. Well, no, it's, it's YouTube trying to go to a certain time, and that's why I was confused. I got you. It comes with a three o'clock day wheel, so you'll need to pop the C clip and swap the... 
<laughs> four o'clock. Daily overnight KX. Wow, Finny. I got a four o'clock kanji, kanji day wheel for mine. I really want to find some four, some 345 kanji day wheels. Um, so if you have a link to those or if, uh, a source for those, that would be that would be really cool. Thank you. Um, you have Spectrum. Hello, what kind of tweezers are you using? Those tweezers, I believe, the ones that I use are, um, they're Vigor, and they're, they're Japanese, but they're high quality. Um, so those are the ones that I use. Uh, I got those from uh, my, my guy that I got almost all my supplies from when he retired. Uh, Federico S. Hi guys, I have two questions. I per I have purchased a 7548700C recently, and on its case back there's an engraving that says B00. How many zeros are there? Three zero 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 one. Do you know what that means? No idea. On its dial, there's a spot that seems hazy, or someone rubbed part of it clear off. Do you know how to repair it? I need to see what you're talking about to know what is on the dial. Um, sometimes you get those seven five. Sometimes you get the 7548s, the Japanese versions, like 7548-7000 or 7000A, and they'll have odd stampings on the case back, like numbers and letters, like literally stamped, not engraved. And those apparently are um, battery change notations uh, potentially done by the military. I don't know. I heard something about it years ago. But... I think the C version that you have, I think those were sold in Europe. But I don't, again, I don't know. Here I am disseminating information without knowing if it's true. Yeah, don't fully listen to him. Take it, what he said, and then research it. And and, and put an asterisk by it and say, maybe. Maybe. Because, I mean, my, my brain is a cluttered, darkened warehouse, spider-haunted nightmare of completely disorganized nothing. Sometimes things You're are so poetic. Well, you know, it's just like, it's like this warehouse. Sometimes I remember things, sometimes I don't. Okay. Uh, from Richard Lenny. Love the Omega MK4. Is it for sale? Uh, the Mark 40, it, well, it, it, I don't, I keep forgetting I own it. <laughs> I, I did completely service it. I just, I keep forgetting that I own the darn thing. I put it on a generic beads of rice, a vintage one, solid link. It's very nice. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you could certainly talk me out of it. Lord knows it would be, you know, my bride here appreciates it when I bring in money. Um, <laughs> but so I, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to make that kind of investment, sure. I do like it. I just keep forgetting I own it. Marcos Vasquez. Hey, Spencer, amazing work as always. You mentioned you use some chemicals to help stop corrosion from continuing in the pitted areas. Do you mind uh, sharing how you manage this? Uh, well, the, the thing with corrosion, of course, the first thing to do to stop it is to stop getting the metal wet. That's really important. The next thing is, is that I use, well, there's the cleaner that I use in my ultrasonic for my cases is, ammoniated and it stinks. Yeah, but then you're getting it wet. Well, no, but it's, no, but the cleaner is ammonia. What you do is I go and I remove all the, all the loose rust that I can. Then I run it through my cleaner, hot, 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 with this ammoniated clock cleaner stuff. And it, it will, it takes off all, pretty much everything. And what it doesn't take off, it converts to this sort of black looking stuff, which is, I believe, hematite. Uh, and it, that is almost like a patina on bronze, and it just stays there. It won't rust anymore. But what I also do is I just oil it. And so you get oil in there, and it's going to stay fine. You wipe it off, and it's sealed. I mean, I have these blades. These blades are centuries old. They were just kept oiled, and they're perfect. You can keep metal very nice if you take care of it. So in a lot of cases, like the pitting like that, that's somebody going into salt water a lot and never cleaning their watch. And there was enough grot and gruck on the watch in between things that it was able to trap moisture and salt and then eat into the stainless steel. So... He's just standing out there staring at us. Oh, yesterday I was making a little video for hands for a 6105 guy, and I could hear him there, and he watched me silently make the entire video, and then he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, 
and then his next question is, do you just clean hands and dial with Rotoco to get rid of hazing? Uh, you can try. Um, I find that the hazing doesn't really go away. Um, more and more and more, I try to find ways to clean things without touching them, which means more chemicals. I have found through trial and some serious errors with my own stuff that uh, what Seiko Loom will or will not react to. Um, it doesn't react to certain cleaners at all. Like it just sits there. And I can actually run a complete handset if the loom is in strong condition through a specific cleaning cycle and it comes out and the metal is bright and the hand loom hasn't changed at all. I mean, I have to go through a separate thing if I'm gonna lighten it, but that's what I did. These hands were terribly hazy and they were the loom was gray. And I ran them through this process and the metal came out beautifully. And, uh, and then I had to do the loom, but Rotico helps, but some of the haze just won't move. There are some other techniques that I use, but I hesitate to talk about them only because I'm always afraid that I'm going to lead someone to screw their watch up because I, it's easy. Some of the things I use, it's easy to jack your watch up if you don't know what you're doing. And I would just hate for somebody to say, Hey, I tried that trick you talked about and now my Watch is jacked up. Yeah, I mean, think of all the videos of people like saying, cutting your bangs or your fringe is so easy. And then they're like, okay, I'm at home. I'm going to do it. And their fringes go like that. <laughs> you don't want that. No, we don't want the watch version of that happening. <laughs> no. Okay, where was I? There was I. Andrew Warner. Hi, guys. Hope you're keeping safe and well. I picked up a Seiko Grand Quartz 4843-8010 about a week ago. was wondering what you know about the movements in these. From what I can uh, find out online, these have 7 joules, but I'm not sure how they compare to a 7548, for example. Do they have metal train gears, and can they be dialed in as accurately? To me, the Grand and King Seiko Quartz models are great value, and the only issue is the symbol of the dial, which looks like a gentleman's sausage. That's what some people do say about that symbol, uh, and I never thought of it before. I'm going to remove Sebastian. Oh, that's fine. Well, actually, I'm going to pause... Because I can you open your phone for me? Because I want to look up that movement. I looked at it before and I can't quite remember. All right, I had to do a refresher course on these. They are they're typical for their time, which is the 1970s. They seem to have a lot of qualities in uh, like the 7548. Looks like they were using the same kind of tech. So you've got it there. It's got. I mean, the important thing is it's got that variable trimmer right there. That's at seven joules. That's pretty nice. They're also temperature adjusted. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, these, I believe, are twin quartz, which means they have, they should have two crystals that are checking against each other, basically. I'm sure they're fantastic and accurate. Lovely. Seven joules, and it's got that variable trimmer. That's the way to go. You'll be able to dial that thing into high accuracy quartz. From Marcello Dietrich. Hello, Marcello Dietrich. Gorgeous. How would you get the Seiko logo to shine so bright, brilliantly? Mine doesn't, even after complete service, and I'm not reading the next part. <laughs> By the way, gor ah! gorgeous was meant for the watch. I don't mean any disrespect. I don't need Sabrina to be mad at me. <laughs> Come on. You should take a compliment. Terrible at taking compliments. Oh god, Kraken's back. Do you want me to leave you here? No! I can. I'll go get her. Um, the Seiko logos. Okay, so what Marcello is talking about. On a 6105, Seiko every now and they, they used, instead of being a bright, high polish, applied logo that says Seiko, it's, it's a matte finish, like a matte silver. That matte silver reacts to moisture, and it turns black. Um... And it's been, I remember when I first came into this collecting scene, people would get them and they would try to scrape the black off. And it would go immediately, it would go right to brass. You'd ruin the thing. Um, and so it was, again, one of my many quests is to figure out how to make that bright. Um, the way that I do that, and you have to be careful, is a wonderful product called Brasso. And Brasso, though, this is, this is it takes away tarnish, but you get... 
tiny bit of Brasso and you put it on a Q-tip and you rub it in with your fingers so it's not like a loose glob of Brasso on there. You get it so that it's soaked into the fibers. And then I just go and I rest it on top of the logo very lightly. And I just hold it there for a while so that the chemicals of the, of the Brasso, not the abrasive part of it, but literally the liquid chemicals that make it up, can, which are like a vinegar and some other things, like basically like a light acid to, to attack that stuff. You don't rub, you just hold it there and you let it there and then you take it off and you look at it, it won't look any different, but then you take Rotico up and down, not brushing, just up and down like this. And what it will do is it will, the, the Brasso on the Q-tip starts to get at that tarnish and loosen it and then the Rotico, when you're going, and you're snapping it off, will pull it off. And you do that three or four or five times, and it will, it, it'll be, it'll come back to silver. You just slow and steady, and you don't use a lot of rotico, you don't use a lot of pressure, everything is light, everything is slow, and just repeat the process. Keep the rotico away from any dial text, because if the dial text is weakened at all, the rotico will strip it clean off. Not the rotico, the um, brasso will strip it clean off. So, I just gave away one of my secrets. You've talked about it before. Have I? Yeah. Oh. Hi, Smackies. From Simon Godden. Uh, Spencer, I know you've repeatedly said you can't show us the regulation process, but perhaps you could at least talk us through what you are doing. That is a great idea, and I will do that. That is an absolutely excellent idea. I will absolutely do that. Thank you. Um... Uh, <clears throat> Michael Sands, my obsession with the 7548 has deepened and I'm now actively hunting for two versions, a black dial black bezel 7000 and a blue dial Pepsi bezel 700BF. I have both of those here. I have a question. So I know obviously when it's 7000, 7000, but do I say 700B? I usually it's... say 7000B, 7, I don't know, it's, well here, 7548, 7, 7,000F. I say 7,000. Okay. Um, question for you. When did the dial text on the switch between the 6309 style water 150 meter resist text and the SQ divers 150 meter text and which came first? Uh, they came out, as far as I understand it, simultaneously. Where it says water 150 meter, that's JDM. So that's a 7,000. SQ, with that SQ logo, that's world... Um, not Japan. So basically, the like with the <clears throat> like say with uh, the golden tuna seven five four nine seven thousand uh, nine. The last nine that's North America, um, or technically it's world, but that's gonna have this SQ. Whereas the seven thousand of that just has the depth rating and also has kanji day. And so that's the that's the difference. As far as I know, they're all at the same time. Bill Zap. On my 6105 8110, I kept the original hands for some wabi sabi authenticity. It does happen to be my father's watch, so a sentiment of originality was important. The look does not bother me as long as the function was not interrupted. I did, however, swap the crystal to the sapphire as the original was almost sandblasted from bangs and 40 years of wear. The new nearly indestructible crystal makes it super clear and smooth. I did have my original hands reloomed and it goes strongly and is a, has fantastic coloring. Um, well, there's a few things. I mean, there's so many questions about um, there's so many questions about hands and originality in a situation like that where you're the owner and it was your father's watch. You know, you you have to make the call that's right for you. This customer did not have a sentimental attachment to this watch. He didn't know the history. It just it was somebody's beautiful watch, and so he actually elected to have me change the hands to an original handset that I had reloomed with my Vintaloom. So there it is in all of its glory. And I have to admit, it looks better. It looks a lot better. The other handset was just too damaged. You know, maybe if I had an emotional connection to the watch and the history, I would keep it. But I understand why he made this choice and it's why I recommended it. Because I think, I think that, honestly, it just looks better. You know, so all those choices. As for Sapphire, 
uh, I don't know. We don't use sapphire, so mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. Sapphire is strong, but it has a tendency to shatter if you hit it enough, whereas hardlex will take a beating and hold up, which is, you know, it's different strokes. The Watchiologist. I love how your videos almost always have zero dislikes. Well deserved. Thank you. We seem to get uh, dislikes only from a few people who hold a serious grudge. Other than that, no, we don't. I, I mean, I, maybe we just attract the kind of viewers, luckily, who are not contentious. Yes. Not fractious. Not obstreperous. Can I carry on? Sure. From Tom and Spencer, what are you doing with the merch? I'd be happy to show off KVW. Something about the material not being quite right, if I recall. But as the saying goes, don't sacrifice the good for the perfect. It gives me serious anxiety. I am anxious enough as it is by being a human. And, like, he put me in charge of the shirts, and I just couldn't deal with it. I, I don't know. I have been... I, I think of shirt ideas almost every day, just random shirts. And I, I actually kind of wish now, I'm starting to wish, that there was just some site that I could go to that would produce our shirts for us where I could just upload a new design. Because um, I, I think about random stuff all the time that I'd wear on a shirt um, that I just think it'd be funny. But I don't know. I guess I'll put some, I'll put some work into it. Because, I mean, we're just... People want, would buy this stuff if we had it I made. have stickers. We need to buy more. I mean, we just haven't been... Like, I, I'm working, in theory, I'm working on recreating two different rubber straps. And the guy wrote me, he's doing all this fantastic work. And he just wants to collaborate. And I'm just... I don't know. It's just another thing for me to have to deal with. Well, you can't let the person down. That's rude. I know. I need to write him back. It's just, I was like, I have so many things going on. I have so much happening. I need to just do it. The thing is, is I, he, he gives me so much information and is so thorough that I, I, I kind of feel a little overwhelmed. Do you need me to read through it too? Maybe, if you have time, if you don't mind reading it. And if I could get some backup. You give me backup for the straps, I'll give you backup for the t-shirts. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on. Okay, so I guess this is called the Klein Literary Corner. Oh, so now we're taking a break uh, because we've had one of our regular commenters who got us your Omega... Uh, Ryan Walters, he's a literature professor, and he is a real big fan of the writer Kurt Vonnegut. And so um, he, so if you don't want to talk about American post-war American literature, now is the time to click the off button. Okay, I so, thought you were going to stop it for nope. some reason. So it's Klein Literary Corner. <laughs> he's saying a librarian voice. Okay. <laughs> Um, not to hijack or keep injecting info here, but I always felt like Vonnegut was challenging us through non-examples to examine our own behavior. Especially in the case of Billy Pilgrim, it seems as if he were imploring us to think about the consequences of our choices and how they affect other people. So it goes as a literary motif that is meant to be an affront to the reader. The satirical function of the motif is to offend and get the reader to think about the normalization of death and especially death in war and its status as some sort of exception from murder and think it is wrong. Sorry I find so few people willing or able to talk about this much. You know, it's, I, one of the things is I tend to, I tend to uh, consume l literature and things like that without a lot of in-depth thinking. That never occurred to me that So It Goes would have been satirical or designed to provoke the reader. You didn't get that? No. I've only read one book of his and I get it. You've only read one Vonnegut book? I grew up, God, I read them all. Good for you. Um, I don't know. I guess, I, you know what the problem is, is you're a better reader than I am. I just, I read slower. <laughs> My, I, I read, this is going to sound like a humble brag and I don't, I don't mean it that way. This is actually, it's a problem. I read so quickly I can read sentences at a time. I don't read... You said you read blocks at a time. I can read chunks of it. I will see the whole thing, and it comes in. Uh, and so what that means, though, is that I read so quickly that I miss... My comprehension is not great, and I miss a lot of subtlety. Uh, it's one of the reasons, actually, I moved to listening to audiobooks, because then I'm forced to, to really listen to everything and get the nuances. So that's one of the things I missed. I don't know. It's just... For me, it was like it was like Cat's Cradle when I was reading Cat's Cradle. His just unbearable cynicism about. Oh wait, is that a really weird one? I it's the ice. Really it's Ice one. Nine. That's Ice Nine, where you have the the scientist invents a form of ice that can freeze it at room temperature, and basically it's like 
it's just everything is gonna go wrong and you can't stop it from going wrong and it's going to go wrong and then it does go wrong and the entire world freezes at room temperature the ocean freezes I don't rem I just remember I read one and it was really weird his stuff tended to be pretty trippy <laughs> um, I mean I, I, he talks, I mean, he inserts himself into a lot of his stuff, and, like, that's how I know that his favorite drink at the time was a, a black and white and water. Black and white was a, a, a kind of whiskey that I don't believe exists anymore. And he smoked Pall Malls, because he talks about that kind of stuff, because he inserts itself. And so you're always kind of dabbling your toes a little bit in his psyche when you're reading his things. And so he's always, he's ever-present. He is a person, not just as an author, is ever-present there, but... I don't know. It's 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 tough. I need to. I haven't reread them in so long. I'm probably incorrect in a lot of my assessments. Like my memories of a lot of those things are colored by the fact that the person who was reading them was a teenager. So I guess I have to read them after Gone with the Wind. I'll read whatever the. I mean, but like is. Breakfast of Champions, the the one of the main characters is slowly. We don't have it. Uh, we used to have all those. No, things. we didn't. I definitely had it. I didn't get rid of it. Oh, we had all those Vonnegut books, all the old ones. We I, we I, only have one now. We have one. Where would they have gone? I think they got left at your parents' house. They what? have every single one there. That doesn't make any sense because I had them and they traveled with me for years. I didn't get rid of them. They're in that box that those jackasses took from San Francisco. <laughs> when we were moving back from San Francisco to Colorado, it took forever. I don't know why. But there was one box that went missing. And there's all this stuff that we just can't find. And so if so we can't, it's in the box. So if we can't find it, it was in that box that those jackasses took. I know for a fact they got an iron. <laughs> there's some other stuff they got. I can't remember what it is right now. I can't remember. Anyway, so I guess maybe we need to have a book club and all of us sit together and reread. Well, I guess we should start with Slaughterhouse Five. We should read Slaughterhouse Five. Well, I do have that. And for those of you who do want to read Slaughterhouse Five, I can uh, remind me, and I will put in a link to a series of photographs that were taken about seven years after the war ended in Dresden, when cleanup crews found um, an air raid shelter that had been sealed off during the firestorms, and it was found seven years later, still with the people inside. And you want to talk about an idea of the horror of the firestorms in Dresden, uh, that will give you an idea. Um, anyway, that's it. So on that incredibly grim note, we're done. Yes. So happy 14 years. Happy, happy. Happy, happy. Okay. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Bye.